3,000. Right, my name's Maloney. This is the 3,000 podcast. Uh, I'm joined today by a dude I've been on his case for a while to get him on this uh, podcast. He's officially the most requested person with seven requests. <laughs> Yeah, in demand. <laughs> yeah, you are in demand. Jimmy from Jimmy's Burgers slash Easy Fame. Thanks for coming, man. I appreciate it. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Like I said, seven people have requested you, so you're in demand. Yeah, my mom, my brother, <laughs> my sister. Who's been, who's no, been on this? People in the burger scene. <laughs> you're you're a prominent member of the burger scene, the Melbourne hospital scene, and the food scene. Um, First of all, I've always wondered this. What do you? What do people like that are in your industry? What do you write down when you have to put down your occupation? What do you say? Depends who I'm writing it to, I guess. <laughs> depends. Am I trying to impress someone or are I trying I to downplay know. what I'm doing? I'm I don't know. Like it's right. a, it's a funny one. Like I sort of put entertainment, but I don't know. Yeah, you meet someone, you're like, what are you doing? You sort of tell them, you're like, I don't even know how to pigeonhole this. Yeah, I guess I do a lot of everything, so. Yeah, I, I generally put myself down as a chief executive officer or something of the easiest group. Cool. You know, that's you say that if you're trying to impress people, but then you know when other people say, "Oh, what do you do?" I just say I work in hospitality and that's, leave it at that. Right? Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, because yeah, you don't want to big note yourself or anything in, in that sense. No, but I guess with this day and age, with with the internet and you know the term influencer gets thrown around a bit, so <laughs> people sort of say, "I know," but man, that's a fucking thing that people say. <laughs> I think I saw you once on TV and they said, Burger Influencer. Yeah, I definitely didn't have a say in that <laughs> one, that's for sure. <laughs> Fuck that. All right, man. Well, let's start at the beginning. So I know you grew up in Melbourne, but whereabouts specifically did you grow up? I grew up in North Melbourne. Nice. Uh, right smack bang in the city. Yep. And lived there until I was 12. Moved to Yarraville out west or Kingsville technically. Yep. Kingsville's gone through the roof, man. Man, I wish my parents still had that place too. <laughs> oh, they made some, yeah, anyway. But yeah, I enjoyed living there. Uh, sort of, it was nice because I still went to school. I went to school in the city, so it was. Just, I went to uni high, so the same. I didn't lose that touch mm -hmm. to the city. Yep. I'd skate at the sale yards before school and after school. Yep. Uh, I had that connection to the, the real heart of the CBD. Yeah, man. Moved to Yarraville, so there was a little bit of that suburban thing. Um, played, you know, local sports out that way, but still had that solid connection to the city. Yeah, for sure. And like in the city, it, like you went to uni high, I believe. Yes. And that's besides going to RMIT high, that's about as in the city as you can fucking get. Yeah, absolutely. So, and it was a great school. You know, there was, it was a, a lot of intelligent kids. There's a lot of kids whose parents were doctors and lawyers and architects and shit. A lot of doctors specifically because they all were doctors at Royal Melbourne or the Children's and they all lived locally. Royal Parade's the, the medical hub. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, so there was a lot of smart kids to be surrounded by, which I'm grateful for. Yep. So you, obviously you're skating in the city. I was skating in the city about the same time, sale yards and that sort of thing. And I guess you get sort of exposed to art culture pretty early more than maybe some kids in the suburbs yeah I, I was pretty lucky in that sense my father was a curator at the national gallery yeah, right. uh, from a very young age i think he just retired last year and i think he'd been there 40 years wow. and he retired at 64 gold so. watch 40 years yeah, I don't know if you get those anymore unless you work for Australia Post, right? <laughs> you get some diamond fancy thing. Uh, so, yeah, we were, I was exposed to it very early and living in the city and being uh, sort of exposed to the street culture of Melbourne, Dad kind of became somewhat... So he worked in a section of the NGV, which was called the Access Gallery years ago, and that was for creating community exhibitions and for local businesses, schools. He actually was one of the catalysts that started top arts or whatever yep. the vce art award was uh but the, he was one of the early he was the first person to have a graffiti exhibition at the ngv and i think yeah. that was 1992 a specific artist or just a graffiti no it was called pump up the can and it was done in conjunction with vayc which was yes that's what, what try art we used to get the paint from back yeah in the day. that was in north melbourne yeah well it moved to north melbourne it used to be right opposite uni high it, it used did. to be directly over Up the road that, from yeah, school. I remember there, yeah. Yeah, that was at, uh, yeah, VAYCs, and it was Joe Morris's little thing that he ran up And there, then it was, became giant, didn't it? Yeah, then it became giant when mm. Clark bought it off or bought the rights to it and or took it over, essentially. Yeah, wow. Um, so that's a, fuck, man, that's pretty cool. I'd love to find some uh, some old images of that. 92. Yeah, that, that was called... Pump Up The Can, you're saying? No, Off The Wall. Off The Wall. That was Off The Wall. Pump Up The Can was the one that they had before that. 
Um, and the pump up the can was the one that had the impact or panic airbrush of the robot on the front. I remember that catalog still vividly. Yeah. So we, was your dad interested in that sort of art movement or he's getting sort of pushed it because you're interested in it? Or a bit Well, that was my first exposure to it. Right. Uh, and I, I think that wasn't, was it 92 or 93? So I would have been nine or 10 at the time. Yep. I'm pretty sure it was then. Um, might have been later. And got into, you know, kind of got exposed to graffiti then and was fascinated by it. Mm-hmm. You know, there were all these, where I, in Yarraville was great. We had so many incredible artists at the time. We had Duke, all the CKA boys were painting massive legal walls, which were really impressive. And there's imba- a lot of abandoned buildings around there too. Yeah, well, more so now than what there is, what there was then. Yeah, but okay. uh, there was a lot of really high end graffiti art and also heaps of bombing. And we had multiple train lines because you know where Yarraville was you had Footscray you had the St Albans line going one way and you had Werribee and Williamstown going the other way so equal distance from my house was West Footscray station and Yarraville station so I got exposed to both of those lines at the same time um, and heading to the city was you know it was it was in it was an art exhibition the whole way and, and it's only a few stops yeah that's right uh, and it was it was a lot of yeah a lot of exposure to that really early and I'm grateful for that and just sort of I guess dad's initial introduction to graffiti helped that and then after the fact because my brother and i both got so heavily into it my brother still you know still fairly into heavily into graffiti in a in a painting sense he dad developed a lot of his knowledge through us yeah cool. Uh, and i think that there's a lot of street artists and a lot of artists that have come on from those exhibitions and then followed on because of dad's heavy interest and push for graffiti and street art, I think it legitimized it to mm-hmm. a certain extent. I'm bigging you up, dad, just, you know, <laughs> just so you know. I think it legitimized it in the eyes of a lot of people because of where he was in the standing of the art world. If it gets his tick of approval, it's, it's signed off. Yeah, in a sense. And he was, he's been the catalyst, he was the catalyst for so long for Australian art exhibitions that, you know, were at the forefront of where the NGV needed to be. And discussed and 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 brought back to life these artists that needed to be f- mm-hmm. exposed at certain times. He just, just seemed to have an art, an eye for it or a, a knowledge for the art to know when to when it came about. So he was really well respected. And when he legitimised graffiti and street art and said, "Hey, this is this is important," I think there was a lot of people that took note. Yeah, and man, like that's definitely probably I'd have to say the first time in an art movement that the kids are going to school the parents on something like this is something that's kind of cool you 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 can't sleep on this you know what i mean to an extent i guess he was he was already on it and we were just like this is these are the guys you need to be scoping out this is what's happening in this space at the moment this is what's here and then people would go to him for comment in the newspaper or yeah, whatever. Because and he's got the credentials. Correct, because yeah. he was the guy, but he had the knowledge because he had us feeding him yeah. like legit info. Uh, so yeah, he became well respected and artists respected him as well because he was not was he there wasn't a, bullshitting. Was there a backlash from any of the sort of real writers that like, oh, this gallery stuff isn't isn't legit. Like we want it we don't want to be doing that sort of stuff. Like Yeah, there's heaps of writers that are like that. And that's mm, cool. Which yeah. I love. You mm-hmm. know, and that's kind of I mean, that's a really good segue into talking about easy as if you want, but well, there, uh, if that's you on think, the list. It's on the if list. If you yeah. think about, well, you think about the artists that, you know, the writers that are like graffiti. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got these guys, crews, or a lot of the northern suburbs guys, and a lot of the guys that actually like to paint panels. They don't have any respect for that. Mm. They're like, you were just like, Cruz calls them, he calls them face painters. Mm. He's like, fuck these face painters. You know, well, they're getting paid all this money. And they didn't, without us, they don't have any art form. They yeah. don't have this shit. Um, and I, I understand that. And I, I can understand that resentment for it. But also, these are people that then went and pushed themselves as they hustled it out, right? It wasn't just, I'm going to paint panels because I'm being rebellious or because I love painting panels, which is mad. I respect that as well. For sure. But then these guys went and hustled. They're like, people want this shit. Fuck mm. it. I'm going to get paid for it. Why not? Yeah, it's a funny scenario. Like the whole thing about graffiti is to you sort of create something that you don't really uh, you've got nothing and you want to want to make yourself known, 
And then if you're going to make money from that, I think that's a natural evolution. So it's kind of, but it, I'm not in that scene enough to fucking understand. I can see how it would rub the people, the, some people the wrong way, but I can also props to people that fucking cash out and make some money out of it. Like, what are you going to do? Go work a nine to five so you can go paint panels at night all the time? Well, yeah, I guess a lot of the natural progression for a lot of those actual writers was tattoo artist or graphic designer, right? Because they already it. had the they had the vision and the the artistic flair, the creativity to be able to make these things visually appealing. So that would that was where they went to make money. Whereas these other guys were like, I don't want to stop painting. I want to get paid for doing this. And why the why the fuck shouldn't I? Everyone's paying money for it. Yeah. And now what people get paid for is ridiculous. Like if you told you know you tell some of these kids' parents when they first started painting, and their parents cracking the shits out them. What are you doing? You're going to go to jail. You're going to do all this. And even people like, I mean, take Mickey G and take the other you know other old Melbourne writers that went to jail mm. for painting, right? Or 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 that's had, not or had stripes, stupid, is, yeah, well, yeah, or exactly, had stupid yeah. fucking hundreds of thousands of dollars of criminal damage fines. You tell their parents that, hey, man, your mate could be getting a quarter of a million bucks to paint a wall. Mm. Shut up. It's it's hard for some people from the outside that don't understand the, the scene to really get it. It's the same reason, like, kids that have a skate park, whether it's the sale yards back in the day or whether it's, you know, river slide or whatever it's called now, but kids are still going to go jump down 15 stairs because that's what skateboarding is. So it's the same thing. And I think it's hard for people from the outside to understand that. They're like, go and make money. But that's not the essence of where the art form comes from. Yeah, well, I guess that's what... It always comes back to tagging in my in my eyes because people are like, oh, yeah, it's all good. But, you know, the, when people just tag on fences and shit like that, that's that's no good. But that's where all letter form comes from. That's, that's where the art form begins. It begins in how do these letters sit together? How do I create this shape and make this look appealing? It's essentially just calligraphy. Mm. You know, people have a great deal of respect for people who do typeface and typography as graphic designers. A tag is the same shit. Yeah. Uh, learning to understand that is a big part of understanding graffiti and where it comes from and well, what I think it's about. 90% of the people in society, they don't see it. They don't understand that. They just see it. They'll go, I like the colourful big fucking murals. You know, I like this thing. Sorry, man. No, I, mean, I was gonna. I just don't want to burp in the microphone. That's okay. That's right. Mel- mother's the- milk's getting me. We're on the Melbournes. We're on the Melbournes. All right, so... Look, let's. Uh, a mate of mine, he he said when I asked when I interview these people, I've got to bring up something which probably is totally off topic. But what was your first music gig that you went to? He's like, you got to ask everyone this because I think it is kind of interesting. Oh man, I'm pretty lucky. My parents are fucking cool in that sense. Hey? Yeah, <laughs> like nice. the one that I the one that sticks out the like we went to lots as kids. My parents are punk rockers and like as little little kids. Yeah, there's nice. photos of me being held by like crew with piercings everywhere mohawks and shit like that but the one that i remember most vividly was was at the public bar which is now last chance rock and roll mm-hmm. and i would have been in grade three i guess which makes me eight or nine and it was nick cave and tex perkins were playing an acoustic set it was just the two of them and it's a small that's a small venue too it was on a wednesday night but there was literally one other person my mom my dad me and my little brother who was in pusher at the time and they just play for us. And then afterwards, I went up. I was like, hey, can I get your autograph? And Nick Cave wrote, to James, never go to bed, Nick Cave. <laughs> I still have it. That's and awesome. it's like the most, the greatest piece of advice I ever took. And I was like, I didn't sleep anyway, so it's fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was like a Wednesday night or Tuesday night, school night and everything. And Amazing. Was, yeah, so that was that's the one I remember the most. Um, and that place is still kicking, but that dude's got... I think a big hand into trying to keep the tote alive. Yeah, yeah. So Shane and Leanne, I think it is Shane and Leanne. Uh, they've they've worked really hard on the possible campaign to try and save the tote. Uh, I'm not sure how successful they'll be in the end because it's a business and the people who own it are business people. Uh, yeah. And and the uh, lovely, soft, warm, fuzzy, intrinsic elements of possible campaigns and the the music world doesn't necessarily translate to the real business world that's it i think it's a it's a funny scenario with a lot of these fucking places once they're gone they're gone and i think people don't really understand that like if once they're gone that's never coming back whether it's the license point of view from a music license or a, an alcohol license and man in st kilda especially in around chapel street we've seen some of these 3am licenses disappear and they're never ever coming back so once that's gone, it's fucking, it's gone. So I think it's sad and hopefully shit like that, people can get behind them, you know? I think that, look, yeah, they may not save it in their current endeavours, but I don't think it's lost to everyone, even if it does get sold. 
Mm. Well, but fuck yeah. Hopefully- I know there are a lot of people involved that are like artsy people and music people that are involved in potential developments of that area as well. Um, so I, I'm hopeful that even if it does get sold, it remains in good hands and it's not not a shit show. Yeah, it'd be sad. It'd be sad, man. And that's pretty close to where your venue is now. Yeah, real close. Real close. Real close. We always. I used to play pub footy for the Birmingham and the Rochester yeah. back in the days, and then it was the Workers Club Lions team, and we just had this constant saying, and it was "fuck the tote." because we used to have to play against the tote in pub footy. So and I still it. have that in the back of my head every time. Someone's like, oh, yeah, do you reckon they're going to say, ah, fuck the tote, you know? <laughs> I can't help myself. They would have got some good ring-ins, I can imagine, when it came to pub footy, though. Yeah, yeah. That, oh, I, look, that, pub footy's so much fun. Yeah. Uh, uh, if anyone hasn't given it a shot, go and give it a shot if you like playing footy or like football. Have you got an easy team? No, no. Uh, I do, it's a lot of work and it takes a lot to put that on and that pub mm. league takes a lot and a lot of people's generosity to get it going and I think that uh, it's a great it's a great thing uh, it's changed a lot and I think it's far more inclusive than what it used to be so yeah. I think there's a lot more opportunity for, for females for whoever you know it's inclusive to every single person yes. yeah. and that's something that's pretty iconically Melbourne I couldn't see a pub footy league happening in many other cities you know what I mean no I wonder if Sydney has, I feel like Sydney should have a pub rugby touch rugby league they probably do they probably do that's true they've yeah. got good pubs in Sydney I'll they do have good pubs man. fuck Sydney but <laughs> <laughs> no, they do. They've got. To, it's just such Cracker a different. Pubs. It's just such a different scene. Sydney's just a different place. Like from the whole pub scene, it's just it's just so different. Like yeah, Melbourne absolutely. is its own thing. Whether it comes to like you know bands that play at venues, DJs that play at venues, or just even entertainment at venues in general, and the way the pubs are run, it's just so different in Sydney to Melbourne. Here it's more independent. There it's much more big groups and that yeah. sort of thing, which obviously is happening a bit in Melbourne. But we're trying our best to fucking to push past that yeah yeah there's not many good pubs left there's my pub in north melbourne <laughs> there's this your is, pub Gio? yeah the limit the limit castle hotel that's my safe space yeah, your, it's yeah. one of those pubs that still has old blokes that live upstairs yeah. carpet carpet that's the first thing i was gonna say you need Mate, carpet carpet is at the heart of a pub if you take the carpet out of your pub you have a bar you no longer have a pub you have a bar yeah all the acoustics are gone the car i've said this before i'll say it many times carpet is the se- keeper of all the secrets and the teller of no lies there you go it sits there and absorbs everything See? every last bit of vomit every last bit of drink every last even secret, the cigarette everything. butts back in the day my god and even yeah <laughs> um so let's talk about your career if we're going to call it that now <laughs> you start- i like how you put that in I inverted commas know, career sure, yeah, 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 no no yeah. so okay so you started off not doing hospo you you studied yeah. And you were a practicing solicitor, I believe. No, nah, I didn't get there. You didn't get there. No, nah, I didn't get but there. But you were pra- you were studying to do. Yeah, that. nearly nearly finished. Nearly became a solicitor, and then decided that that wasn't a world that I wanted to live in. Uh, as much as I still had friends in the industry and friends that still are in the industry, uh, a lot have left. Mm. But it was not an environment I saw myself working in. I think the prime example was, you know, I was working, I managed to work at some really big firms. So I got a taste of what it might have, you know, the eventual space might have been like and seeing how the partners live if you've ever stuck it out and got to that point. And it was extremely judgmental and very backwards. And I found that it was really, uh, a lot of it didn't represent what I stood for. Hmm. It was a lot of misappropriation of people's funds and time and stuff like that which I just I couldn't stomach and no room to be creative you know what I mean absolutely none at all so um, you know like and that's the thing white collar people I'd, uh, that's not my kind of thing it's not my kind of job but you know they do their thing but there is zero room to be creative and I can kind of see why people get themselves in these ruts and I think a lot of them probably are because they're sort of stuck in these sort of desk jobs that they don't want to do so it's awesome that you figured out that's what you didn't want to do and fucking change it up man roll the dice a little bit yeah i certainly rolled the dice you gotta roll the dice so then so i don't know exactly how the timeline goes but then there's a book or you had a love for food obviously i had a love yeah food definitely burgers more specifically uh and comfort food I mean, I always cooked at home because I hated doing the dishes. That was the deal. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's kind of one or the other. Uh, And I decided that there was an opportunity in the market. In 2009, I wanted to do a blog about burgers. 
and I went over to the States and traveled around there and I think I had 56 or 57 burgers in a two week period mm-hmm. and wrote all these like write ups around what they were and what the burger was like and took photos. I came back all excited and ready to do this thing and someone at work was like, oh, have you seen the Burger Adventure, this blog about burgers? I'm like, get It was an Aussie fucked. dude as well? Yeah, well, they're Melbourne crew oh. and they're mad, like mm. mad respect to the Brendan and uh, the rest of the, the Burger Adventure crew. They, they really did a good thing. Um, but like I shelved the idea for a while and then that was 2009, So I'm trying to think just social media wise, Instagram was just coming out 2009 or 2010? I think 2010. Yeah. Uh, and then 2000, I think I got Instagram in 2011, end of 2011, maybe. Yeah. So before that, that was, it's that was my personal Instagram. Yeah. yeah. That was where it, it was sort of, yeah, you had a blog or a website. It was, um, what was that blog website? Everyone at WordPress, you could use that or like, mm-hmm. there was like the Tumblr one, which was, I get more photographic. Tumblr was good. And then you had MySpace, right? Which was kind of the same thing. And MySpace and different Facebook, Facebook hadn't really even invented pages at that point. But yeah, I'd the had, whole space was a bit confused. There. Yeah. I had a really early exposure to those things. Like Facebook was at my university, at Bond University on the Gold Coast. I think it was the first place in Australia to have Facebook Mm -hmm. because all the American students had come over from their college and been like, yo, we need to have this stuff. And then you needed an admin and someone who was like in charge of the, the, whatever the Facebook page. And you can only add people within that network. That was like essentially beta sort of. Yeah. Yeah, it was really early. That was 2005, I think. Yeah, right. Yeah, because um, I don't think it went public in, in Australia until about 2007. Yeah, I think it might have been that long. Uh, so, yeah, I was kind of exposed to it and had MySpace all those years ago. And, yeah, I, I left the burger idea for a while and I was uh, travelled on the law path. It was, it was really early. So there was a little, there was elements of creativity and understanding of creativity and what to do if you are creative uh, and how to protect those things. And some friends of mine had a publishing company and they specialized in food books. So they were doing produce to platter type, I guess, guides to areas and regional areas. And I was snowboarding with the, with Danny and Katie Wilton, who they owned the publishing company with their mum, Johnette. Uh, and I'd snowboard with them almost every weekend. And every Sunday night, I'd be driving back from Buller and be like, I don't want to go to work tomorrow. I hate these dickheads. I don't want to fucking iron a shirt. I don't want to put on a suit. Fuck. Be hung over from the night before. And then one Sunday I was like, hey, what do you guys reckon about writing a book about hamburgers? Because it was just, I think that was the time Huxter Burger had come along, like Dan had opened Huxter Burger and a few things had started to sort of change the burger landscape a little bit. And mm-hmm. I could sense that things were going to shift sort of heavily in the American burger style and I was hopeful they would anyway uh and they came back a week or so later and said yeah we've spoken to our publicist we think it's a really good idea um boom burger uh burger so book. I quit yeah that's I it. pretty much quit really? I was like I'll see you later that's it uh I don't want to do this anymore I'll catch you later yeah and I went to write the book about burgers and started my Instagram page then that was August I think it was August 23rd 18 2012 yeah. Uh, and 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 Instagram didn't have videos for quite a while as well. No. So it's literally photos. Here's a burger. Yep. So it's totally different to the content that kids are used to consuming now or creating, where they're like, "Look at me eat this thing." You were just like, "Here's the burger." This is what I think of it. Yeah. So and you couldn't even. It's it's hard for you to get your personality across when you're like, "Here's a burger. Here's me." Well, I mean, of- there was. It wasn't so bad because I think that was where the strength of someone's ability to write was important. So I was able to write. Mm -hmm. captions that would describe what it was that I was eating and I think that was cool and I really like I wish Instagram would go back to that personally but uh, no videos oh yeah it'd be great and if everything was chronological as well because that was just a psychology of human use and when are they going to use it so you can so it's not chronological anymore if you skip back far enough I don't know what it does who knows what it does it just feeds you whatever it needs to feed you I feel like they're just trying to chase their tail to catch up to TikTok that it's kind of getting a bit messy I think if they're sensible about it they'll probably could just hang on and watch TikTok disappear but they're too stressed about it TikTok's gonna get torched yeah I think well you've seen Montana's already cancelled TikTok Mm. in the States that's the beginning I think that there's so many security issues and so many so many spaces for manipulation that can't be regulated mm. like it can in other media forms you know you other television and radio media can all be controlled and regulated social media can't be in that sense so 
I think there will come a time when those things start to get throttled or changed or removed. Yeah, and I guess we also have to think back to then. That was before Instagram was owned by Facebook. So there was no thought to monetize it. They would just it was just people who had created Posting it. pictures. Yeah. Post your picture. That's it. And it's funny now because this this fucking platform dropped off and I think it's because Instagram strangled them. But they got videos because of Vine. Remember Vine had those mm-hmm. like six second or thirteen mm-hmm. second videos? Yep. And that's why Instagram applied videos or they brought them in i'm pretty sure yep. and that killed vine and then instagram continued and now you look at some people's pages and all it is is videos the actual there's, photography I've, yeah. I've spoken to facebook and they said there's no point posting imagery unless it's in a carousel or even a number of images in a video right they're like there's just no there's a waste of your time okay because the algorithm is just going to push that to the bottom yep. you need this okay yeah but the thing is, what I've, from my experience with Instagram, is you've got your core followers who will still see that content and like it and potentially comment as long as you've got good content. And more importantly, as long as you've got a good, like, follow network who's engaged with you. Mm-hmm. And I guess that helps, but it's probably not going to get you on the fucking the promotions pages that you want to be. No, on. absolutely not. It's just some idiot. And even the worst, the thing that I found most frustrating with Instagram is that <coughs> they started prioritizing things that were reposted or they weren't original content. Mm. And as someone who, like, not blow my own horn, but, like, I've been doing that since 2012. I've been traveling around and eating burgers and creating my own content and taking these photos and paying for them all mm. and paying for all the travel. Like, if I was to add it up, it would be three quarters of a million to a million dollars over that 10-year period I've spent on traveling and, and eating food just to create content to go on this platform for other people to then reshare it or to drive drive people to a platform and then you get all this stupid shit that gets exposed to it. Yeah, the resharing things are funny when like for some things I'll reshare content but I'll always message the person directly say hey, I really like your content, you're it's really cool, I'll credit you. Do you mind if I reshare it? And if they say no, then I won't. But most of the time people are cool and they say yes. Yeah, I'm normally like that. Yeah. But Absolutely. when they don't ask you, fuck it, man, that's pretty this is And they don't tag you, it's even worse. Well, that's that's just not like, on, but they should always credit you, but that's the thing with Instagram there's no recourse. Yeah. But but people can build like big accounts with a lot of followers with zero original content without tagging anybody and that's just what they do. Mm-hmm. Because once it's out there on the internet and it fucking belongs to nobody. Mm-hmm. And that's when it kind of lost me. Like I, I meet people, they're like, oh, this person's got an Instagram account with 100,000 followers. I'm like, but all they do is repost memes. Mm. Like that's not, there's nothing like, what do you sit on 4chan or fucking Reddit and just find something cool and post it to the other people? That's not creating content. That's just regurgitating content. Absolutely. <laughs> but that's Shit the way drives that me it, insane. Yeah, but that's the way that they're pushing that whole thing. Yeah. And they can't... The other thing that they can't throttle is um, physical appearance content. Mm. The old ass and titties and sex part that they can't stop. Yeah. Even if they wanted to. They can censor it, but they can't stop the virality of it because people want to see it. Yeah, and that's it, yeah. It's human nature. It's hard, like, with your algorithms, you see some boobs and you stop and you're like, I can't stop there. I've got to keep scrolling because that'll fuck my algorithm up. Yeah. I mean, look, mine's mine's literally just golden retrievers now. <laughs> uh, golden algorithm. retrievers and burgers. There you go. So with the whole burger thing, you've got your... Oh, yeah, it's, well, no, there's always there's one. There's one. There. There's, there's, always a a there's always a couple. There's always a couple. Keep it real. All right, so... Man, I'm thinking back now, probably 2012, 2013, that's probably where I reckon I first met you, at a burger burger gig slash strip joint type scenario where uh, you were doing your burger blog. Oh, was that Boobs and Burgers? Yeah, it was one of the early ones. So I was DJing there before I even started emceeing there and you came up and you're like, hey man, I'm doing this burger blog and that was early days and that's when I first saw that Melbourne tattoo and I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool and then I said to Mick, I'm like, oh, I met this dude the other day I had the Melbourne can tattoo. I like those colours and then we came up with this design and we did that which was kind of inspired from your your Melbourne can but uh, man, I remember meeting you there and you're like, yeah, I've got this burger blog and I'm like, oh, okay. I didn't think too much about it and then start to see you on the Instagram and fucking, I guess, man, it's like like anything. You got to give it a crack, and you you, you know you got to start somewhere. Like where do you where what do you do? You go to every burger joint in town. Mm, that's really what I was doing. I was Even trying to be the first were- person to go to all the places. You know, someone's just open. I wanted to be the first to get there. Yeah, uh, and I wanted to cover as much territory as I could. And I guess it helped because I'd already done. The, so the deal with the book was that it was going to be a guide to burgers in Victoria. So that was the 
coincidental timing of starting the Instagram and the book was me going to check out all these places so I could then post instantly on Instagram and try and build mm -hmm. this following or reputation on Instagram so that eventually it would cross over, right? Is there a guidebook at this point? Is there anyone who's doing a similar thing somewhere else that you can look at or are you going, this is just fucking something I'm having a crack at? Uh, no, there's not really anything like it. The only yeah. So George Moats, bloke in America, I call him the godfather of hamburgers because he's someone who really just fucking loves burgers. Mm -hmm. It's like me. Like he, he's so passionate about hamburgers. He loves the history of them. All of these places in America. He did a documentary called Hamburger America, which I think he did in like 2003 or four or something and then wrote a book to go with it. He's a filmmaker by by trade. Um, and then he he's he's maintained the history of burgers and the geographical history of hamburgers in America. So he's traveled to all of these states and all of these places. Yep. He only recently, so there's a show called The Burger Show, hosted by Alvin Kalin, uh, who's a chef in the, in the US, and he started with a place in New York, Amboy, and then opened a burger place in LA, and then has Egg Slut, which is the other, which started in the um, central, name. yeah, central markets in LA. Mm. Uh, so he's, so Alvin hosts The Burger Show, and Georgia started, co-hosting and has now has the burger scholars element of the burger show where he teaches people about this is what this burger is and this is why this burger is like this and this is where this burger is from and these are the people who made it the first time and this is why this burger is great uh so there was uh i forget where i was going with that <laughs> no, but you're just uh, I'm sure, is there someone who you could sort of map this out so yeah so there's not really it. there's not really anyone that's done it uh, certainly not here yeah and then george, so george just started doing that with alvin and then they've, they've built that in the US. There are other people that do it in different countries and different geographic regions. Now they'd be everywhere, but back then it's yeah. a different story. Well, back then I was, you know, I was one of the first to do it on Instagram. Uh, there was a, there's another guy who was the CEO of Max Hamburgers in Sweden, Richard Bergfors. He does burger spotting. So he does lots of European burgers where he mm. travels around. And now there's lots of people that have come up in the UK. There was heaps, Tom's Big Eats and... A few others that have done it on social media and in, in the UK. My friend Kate Ovens, she started eating really big meals and became like one of those professional eater people and now she just travels the world. She was just at Monaco Grand Prix playing poker against Neymar and beat him and shit like that. Like From just eating big meals? Yeah, yeah. Just being right. being uh, an attractive, attractive person that eats stupid amounts of food. That always helps with the whole social media thing, doesn't it? Oh, if yeah. you're good looking, like you can sort of get away with a little bit more and people are going to stop for your content and all that sort of thing. Absolutely. Um, so I think this is like with Instagram and obviously now we all understand this a bit more, but in 2012, 2013, building a brand isn't really as a thing like it is now, but I guess you know you've got to build the brand yeah. and now everyone talks about building a brand, but essentially you were doing that, you're building your own brand Um was that a conscious thing or you're just like, I'm going to do the blog thing and then whether this brings me into another territory of building my personal brand? It was definitely a conscious thing. You did, so you knew that's what, yeah. Yeah. Where it was going to take me, I didn't know because mm -hmm. it was an unknown media at the time. Uh, and I think I'm grateful ha for having done it the way that I did because then once the book was out, sold the book and started working on easies. So it was at that time I went from August 2012 Completed writing the book in July 2013. By the time it came back from the printers, it was December 2013. February 2014, we started working on Easy's. Uh, and through that period, and then up until, you know, we opened Easy's the 1st of May 2015. When you say, it could, sorry, just correct, like just to jump in, but you say Easy's because that's where it is, but is this just a concept that isn't, you don't have a location yet or you knew that's- No, no, it came be the other way around. I always said that I didn't want to open a burger place because I've been so critical and judgmental about other people's right. joints. I'm like, this is just fraught with okay, danger. So, it came the, so you had the location you, and you had to make it work there sort of thing. Well, that that came after the fact. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I always swore I'd never open a burger place because I'd been critical of people and probably- unfairly in some instances and certainly knowing what i know but now what I critic, was, so that's your fucking job man yeah but also having an understanding of what it takes to operate a hospitality venue now and and for Keep some the of the quality some up. of the criticisms i probably made of people <laughs> were probably unfair and unjust and yeah. i'm i'm happy to admit that so i made a conscious decision when i started working on easies that i would stop being critical to a certain extent and try and be positive about people's venues because you know at the end of the day it might be someone's mortgage 
they've mortgaged their house so that they can open this place. And I've gone in there and said, no, this place is just no, no good, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And then no one ever goes there and they close down and they lose their house, right? Can you imagine <laughs> the consciousness? Yeah, yeah. Like that's a horrible, a horrible outcome. So yeah, I, was, I started to become far more conscious of what my words and not to be arrogant in any way but like they hold weight, they, yeah. well it did at the time and mm. there was enough there was enough people following me to, to for that to have an impact on someone's business far better to use that for a positive impact right yeah uh so yeah i i, I always swore i'd never do a burger place i was never uh, i was too dangerous people were just going to be like fuck this guy he's a scumbag he did x y and z so i swore i'd never do it and then this opportunity came up February, so it was an old rider prowler, mm-hmm. rider and MC. RDC. RDC, bro. I had the old Rock RDC the book back in the right. day. Remember that book? Yep. Yeah. What a good album too. That first that first album they brought out was fucking unreal. Um, and yeah, Prowler and the Architects V Belling from ITN. So they just completed The Hive, which is in Carlton behind mm-hmm. where Capitano's is. Used to be the Beaufort. Uh also one of the first places I went to and Dave Kerr wrote about me in broadsheet because I went there the day that they opened and that was like the, the first day I'd quit. That was the first, the night that I'd quit law to go and write this book. And I told Dave about it at the time and he wrote about me in broadsheet. So cheers, Dave Kerr. <laughs> Thanks, Dangerous Dave. DK. Um, but yeah, they had a building called the Hive that was right behind where the Beaufort was and they just completed it. So it was a concrete building, graffiti inspired, rooms and shit with arrows and the windows are arrows and like it's a whole big space that's dedicated to graffiti the next iteration in this series of buildings that they were planning to do was easy's or the end-to-end building uh as which it still says on the side there the end-to-end. yeah so that's that's what the building was designed as uh, and yeah prowler said look we're doing this do you guys want to put a bar in the train and originally like i was i'd finished the book and i'm like wow Seem, be, seems silly not to try and weigh in on this burger thing. Like, it's still massive. People are still, you know, still fucking with burgers pretty hard. Maybe we should try and put a burger place in here. And originally, we talked about putting a kitchen outside the train, and like upstairs, and so they having had, a train carriage. They had it set to go with the three carriages on Nothing the was, like, the building wasn't finished, but the trains and the concept was up. Yeah. And it was like, all right, what do you want to do in here? Yeah, right. They'd already commenced the liquor license process. And it turns out that that was to take another 15 months or something from mm-hmm. when we started. And the, the, the concept grew and grew and grew. Originally, someone else was going to run a downstairs area as a separate cafe. They pulled out, I think, fuck. Um, and then it just grew from there. Mm-hmm. And so that was, yeah, from February 2014, we started working hard on it. And then in the end... I mean, there are a lot of things that we went through. Builders that were building the building fucked us over. I'm, mm. I'm happy to say that. And took what, a bunch of cash bu- and just said, build? yeah, and then just bailed on the fucking fit out. Didn't even get certificate of occupancy. So I had to get other people in to finish off the job. Uh, they took a bunch of cash and bit off it. But we got other people in to complete the job and we made it the way we wanted to make it with some you know there was some input from the arch- the architect was very protective of the way that the inside of the building looked which is strange because he made it so complicated for us to fucking do anything in yeah. uh and we built like the concrete slab above so the kitchen's on the third floor and the concrete slab above the kitchen was so thick we couldn't put a hole in it to put the exhaust out there and i had to go out the side he didn't want anything going above the trains and a whole bunch of shit right Nightmare cost heaps more than what we thought. Mm. Uh, and we finally got it open. There were so many objections at the time. My friend Jono's mum's partner, Victor, was living in the warehouse two down and he was like a caretaker of the commercial premises. But he objected to the liquor license so heavily and there was another guy over the back who at the time I think was a fair work commissioner and they objected so heavily to the liquor license being approved, saying that we were going to change the fabric of Easy Street and that there was going to be prostitutes and it was going to be like That's- King's Cross and all this shit. Like to the point where, and bless Victor, I'm still really good mates with his partner's son. Um, but like he hand wrote like 40 pages of shit and just they just made everything so hard and cost us so much more money. Uh, and but when that- you break it down though, you 
We've yeah. never had a noise complaint there. Yeah, There's never been any fucking problems. No one's ever done anything. I mean, one per- someone jumped up and fucking... I'm pretty sure it was Nost. Nost and Pork jump up and fucking did the rooftop and the glass. And then the guy who owned that building came in and said, we had to pay to clean it. I'm like, fuck out of here, man. Look at every single building in every Fitzroy rooftop. and Collingwood at the time. They're yeah. fucking on everyone. How's that our fault? Yeah. Uh, and then it got worse because the guy got up to clean it. Part of the pressure hose cracked one of the windows and everything. Just like everything became a nightmare. But every... Look, okay, let's break it down. If you don't have train carriages on the fucking roof, you're going to have a rooftop bar, which is going to be reasonably open air. Well, it wasn't. Gonna- it was originally supposed to just be offices. That's why it was... That's why there was a big issue. But you're on. You're right next to Smith Street that, there. Like, well, I mean, the OG like- planning permit was for, for offices. So that's why there was a, okay. there was a kick up of, of a fuss because of that. Yeah, oh man, I just can't get my head around anybody who lives in these like you know areas, and then they still they want to have their cake and eat it too. You want to live in a fucking area that and has we drove cool the culture? price of your fucking house up exactly. Full stop. The end. Fuck yeah. off. Yeah, exactly, man. And then they complain about it. I can't like I moved to the fucking peninsula because I want to chill out. Yeah, I don't live on fucking. Smith I live in North Street Melbourne. Complain. It's fucking dead quiet. It's a country town in the city. It's the best. It's a funny little pocket, North Melbourne. There, love man. It. Yeah, I love it. Uh, my mate I lived walk there everywhere. for a while. It's it's so quiet, but then you are so close to everything. Mm-hmm. It is kind of cool. Um. Well, let's jump off easies for a second. Let's talk about North Melbourne because I have to bring it up, man. You are a Kangas fan, yep. diehard Kangas fan. I saw yep. you at the game. Mate, I don't, on I don't miss many games. Mate, it must be many. tough though. Yeah, yeah, but I'm also lucky enough to have grown up in the 90s and watched two premierships and one that we should have beaten Adelaide. That was a disaster. Uh, we coughed that one up. So, yeah, I've been lucky enough to go through that and I think – I always have a very strong connection with the club, the, my pub. We have the boys in for their Mad Monday and yeah, nice. Terrible Tuesday and Westgate Wednesday and stuff every year. So they come Westgate and Wednesday. pull the blinds down. No one's allowed in there. They can just relax, do their thing. And there's no risk of shit making to the media about this person. This happened on Mad Monday. Yeah, doesn't happen. Yeah, uh, and because of that, I've become you know fairly close with some of the boys or close enough to. Call mates or hang out with them, play golf and stuff with them, and yeah, I'm I'm close and I feel their pain, and it's been a long suffering period, and I'm hopeful that it's not going to be forever. Um, we've got some good signs. You've got yeah, Sheasel's a good. He's a jet, isn't he? Yeah, uh, yeah, we've got some good signs, and I'm I'm excited. Jai Sim can just sign for another five years or something. Yeah, Jai's is going to stay at the club forever, and I mean Jai brings every year when the new boys come, Jai brings them all to Easy's and. We sit and chat, and they always. I mean, to be honest, all the kids, all the kids that we've had over the last few years, always straight away in the messages. Thanks so much for having us, blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that's a pretty good sign for a 19 year old kid or 18 year old kid that's just been introduced to someone. They're like, this is Jimmy. Jimmy goes to most games. He's a, he's a mad fan, yeah. but also he has this place in the pub that we go to. So be nice to Jimmy. And there's a few of them that just come back all the time. Like Eddie Ford comes in all the time. He always sneaks in, never tells me he's coming. Only if I walk out and I awesome. see him, he's like, what's going on? Nice. Um, yeah, I think they just like the place. And I I think, I'm not 100% sure, but are they moving North Melbourne Station or they have moved it or they're changing the name from one North Melbourne Station to another? Arden Street's going to be a station? Yeah, so Arden Station is going to come in and that's on Lauren Street, which is like where the footy ground is. The footy ground sits between Arden Street and Macaulay Road and where it, just Lauren Street is perpendicular. I live a block away from where the new station is. I can see the entrance to the new station from my house. Uh, so that's going to be a big-ass new station right there. That'll be called Arden Station. Right. But I'm not sure if they're changing the name of the other one to West Melbourne or if it's staying North Melbourne. That was, yeah, something like that. They were moving North Melbourne and then West Melbourne was going to p- become North Melbourne or something like that. No, I think they're changing North Melbourne Station to West Melbourne Station. Oh, okay. And that'll become Arden Station. And then they're oh. developing that whole area and putting extra grounds and all kinds of stuff. There, there. is a whole lot of space in there that it was just sort yeah, it was of nothing. It was just train nothing. yards. Yeah. Yeah. And, and oh, that's yards. cool. Yeah. I feel like that shit's been going on for like five years. It'd be cool when it's done. Well, the the station's a fair way along. Like you can see, when you drive past, you can see like a big entrance dome. And Will you be there you, with your Mikey card, fucking first one on the... Look, I can't remember if I bought a ticket or <laughs> when I last bought a ticket. <laughs> been a long off. fucking time, I'll tell you what. <laughs> Uh, I am a massive train nerd and I didn't often pay to catch them. That's good, man. That's Only good. in Sydney because they're fucking savage up there. 
the the Metcops, or they don't call them Metcops. Man, you know the I, Gumbies. The Gumby. I was Gumbies. That's, that's exactly what I was about to say. I think that's such an iconically Melbourne thing because they obviously wore green and people. Yeah, the Gumbies. Everyone used to be like, "Watch out for the Gumbies," and that's something that they wouldn't say anywhere else. Mate, I remember catching the fifty-seven, and there was like still a conductor on there. You get on and buy a ticket. Short trip. Then they yeah, punch the, the hole. Short trip. <laughs> There was the, the, the you old get two stops, a two second, two the old second. W class ones, and they had the conductor that would sit there. But if you got on the back door, they because they would sit at the front, yeah. so you could jump on or the, the other way around, depending on the on the fifty seven because it was I think that was W class. Nah, they were the old Rattler ones that oh, they still no, use today with the Rattler. city circle. But yeah, and they had they sit up in their seat and so, sit yeah. on. That's it, man. Um, I love those trams, and look, man, trams are so fucking iconically Melbourne, and it's trams are always free. That's what I tell everyone. And now now they are actually free if you go in the city. Anyone who came from interstate, I was always like, catch a tram. A tram's free. Yeah. Uh, anyone who's coming from another country or another city and they're buying a ticket is kidding themselves. Like, what are they going to, where are they going <laughs> to send you a you fine up. to? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So let, let's uh, go back to the graffiti sort of, obviously you've got a, tr- a fucking venue with trains on the roof. You're going to attract a lot of graffiti dudes. People want to paint your trains. How do you fucking police who gets to paint what, how, what? Like, because obviously the place is bombed inside, but like, how do you police who does what or do you, is it open slather? So inside the train carriage where the walls are white, people don't tag there. And if you do, it's only little fuckheads that tag in there that have no respect or no idea what the fuck they're doing. Yeah. That will tag in there. And I fucking hate it. Like if I catch them, that what if they slap a sticker? Stickers fine. I don't care about stickers. I can just peel it off. Yeah, okay. In the stairs, whatever you want. Yeah, cool. Do whatever you want. Just no paint while we're open because you stink the whole fucking joint out and Mm. people won't enjoy their meals, right? When it comes to painting outside the trains, you either have to have painted a shit ton of trains in your country if you're not from Melbourne or your city, or you have to have painted a high task train in service and had it run. Otherwise, I won't let you paint it. Really? So I never painted them. I did run-ups and all kinds of shit on them, but I never actually painted a high task so I've never painted it. Right. I've never even painted my own train. Yeah. Uh, so I'm very strict about that. That's cool. Uh, so do you get dudes just rock up with a backpack? Like, hey, man, we're just going to paint this. You're like, nah, it's not going to happen. Nah, not so much anymore. But like, we, used to, I still, we get a lot of messages and a lot of people ask. And I feel bad because there are some people that are fucking phenomenal artists. Yeah. I'd love to have paint it. Um, but I just, I've got a pretty strict rule. I mean, we've had some pretty fucking serious yeah, people the one paint up crew. it, right? One up. They never painted the train. Like I, I thought uh, they did. No, nah, they wanted to paint. They wanted to paint the outside. They've done like throw ups and done tags and shit in there. They wanted to paint the other side, like the outside outside, uh, uh, and showed up. One of them's like, "Yeah, I've got like a rigging license and blah blah blah." Can we paint? I'm like, "Nah, bro." Down the as soon building. as you jump over the edge, the council will be here. There'll be some dickhead in the other street. It takes a photo of you and sends it to the council. I'll be here in five minutes, and you'll get shut down. I don't want a half finished piece on it, right? Uh, but we've had like, like Felipe Pantone, Soffles, Fat Joe. I painted it with Fat Joe, the rapper, one time. Fat Joe. Yeah, Ben Simmons painted it with uh, with Ling, yeah. with Maddie Ling. Um, what did Felipe Pantone do? Because obviously, well, he Felipe Felipe did a pant, yeah, a pant piece, and then Fat Joe and I cap. Fat really? Joe did a chrome float over the top of the pant. Has I'll Fat Joe can- got any style? Fat Joe's a bomber. He's Tats crew from New York. Man. Oh, really? He's bad. Oh, there you go. But he didn't hurt me. He's like, man, can you do these Can you do these bubbles? Can you do this outline? Oh, he was just funny. Fuck, it was so funny. <laughs> he, came, he came one time to do... Whoa, I interviewed him for Complex. Yeah. And then I went to his show that night, and he's like, yo, he got me on stage. This was, he dropped Lean Back for the first time on stage, and he got me on stage to be like, yo, you've got to go check out my boy Jimmy's joint. He's got subway cars on the roof, blah, blah, blah. That's- and then afterwards, after the show, he's like, man, you got to let me get on one of them trains. Uh, and I was doing a cheeseburger eating comp the next day, we were right, like, right at the end of it, and he just walked in to this cheeseburger eating. I'm like, hey, everyone, special guest, Fat Joe. It was fucking bizarre, man. And then we went and painted it and sat up there and he told the best, he had the best yarns, man. Really? My God, did he have some yarns. Yeah, I think it's funny because Fat Joe has been around hip hop for a long time and people know him from more of that commercial club stuff now, but he was like DITC and all that sort of stuff back in the day. So that's how I, when he came, I'd already, I'd just been in New York with a friend of mine and uh, Delta from Adelaide. Mm Mm-hmm. And my mate Luke and I were there and we were filming 
Delta and a whole bunch of shit around hip hop in in New York and specifically DITC because Lord Finesse and mm-hmm. Delta were real tight. Really, uh, Show and AG and Delta were real tight. And um, man, I went and ate burgers with Lord Finesse and he told us a story about how he signed Big L. Unbelievable, no shit. unbelievable. But anyway, so I met them and then we went. Do you to- want to tell us the story? Tell us the story. Uh, he was literally signing records at a record store. And Big L came in and he's like, yo, you got to sign me. I'm nice. And, and Finesse is like, hey, everybody come, come to me and say they nice. He's like, what you got? And he just rapped for him. He's like, yo. Yeah, man. Yeah, Big L is the realist. Um, Big L is like, okay, uh, there's a lot of people that aren't with us anymore, but I feel that he yeah. never really showed his true... True, where he could have got to. What I would give to have yeah, for man. more Big L. Yeah, like so good, so ahead of his time with his punchlines and his flows and just, I don't know, his voice. He had everything, man. He had all of the it. The whole set. A whole, everything and like good and beat selection. And a mad vocabulary. Yeah. Right, he was a don. He, he, he's one of the best. Well at, before his time. Yeah, for sure, man. For sure. And just, yeah, his punchlines were just... To rap and sound good, but then to also so make people laugh as well. The MRC. Yeah, he was he was good. He was good, man. So yeah, this was so I was there with these guys, and then Delta had become friends with some guys because he was. Who was he living? I think he was living in Harlem, maybe at the time. Delta been, was, but he'd been in the Bronx for a while, and he'd already done stuff with Cool. Anyway, so we get there, we go to this show in the East Village. Because uh, there was another guy, Dave, who played in a group called Dugius, and we went to go watch them play. And actually, Zv, the architect from Easy's, was there this night as well. Coincidentally, and, yeah, because he played a show because he plays in the Public Afro Opinion Orchestra, but he was doing something else in in New York at the time. And Delta had got this record for Cool Herc, and he was giving it to Cool Herc this night. So we've got a video of Cool Herc bowing to Delta in the he, club because he found him this because he found him this record that he'd been looking his whole life for. What the fuck? Anyway, like so, he's just, literally digging in the crates. Literally <laughs> digging in the crates, right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I was through all this, and then we went to. So he'd become friends with Nysa and Bio and BG One Eight Three from Tats Crew. So we went to their studio, which is at, at the Point CDC in the Bronx, which is like. Uh, like a community center, I mm-hmm. suppose. Um, and we're just sitting there hanging out with these these guys. And Joe used to be in their crew when they were growing up. Yeah. So when he came to Australia, and obviously a combination of DITC and the Tats crew came to easy, and I was telling him this story. He's like, "No fucking way, man!" So yeah, he came down and we hung out. It was uh, it was it was, it was a pretty special, was a pretty special time. Man, and burgers have taken you all the way there. Yeah, <laughs> ain't that the truth? Uh, it's not what you know. It's who you know. When we so Delta is obviously a huge deal in South Australia. They they love him. The Lost Australian. Hey. The Lost Australian. Yeah, but man, and he he's look. I don't think there's anywhere in Australia that loves Aussie hip hop more than South Australia. I think you're right. I think we we love it here in Melbourne, but I think South Australia, Adelaide, man, they just they love it. They fucking they live for it. But our yeah, that's sick, man. Can you send me that? Yeah. Um, but uh, <laughs> our the best time. Look at, Probably. His, look at his dirty floating crack piece. Oh, yeah, because it was Joey Crack. Yeah. Is that, so it, crack was when he was Tats Crew. Yeah, he's Crack Tats. It, and he even did a Tats, tats Crow on the side. That is pretty cool, though, man. Talking all that shit. So so he's just capped. There's no bubble yeah. around it, so he no, just capped. just floated straight over the top of Felipe's <laughs> piece. Like, not even a fucking- Felipe's fuck. probably one of the most mm. renowned like artists in the world. 100%. And has, have you sent him that? to say not Felipe? Yeah, yeah, I've told him. And what does he say? He's like, man, I, what, am I, what do I say? <laughs> What do I say to that? If Joey Crack wants to cap me, I'll get his copper. Joey Crack. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, I yeah, love so- he tells a story about why he's Joey Crack too. He gets up in school and his ass crack was hanging out. Joey Crack. I just thought he was probably serving packs of crap, no, man. No, it's crack. definitely not that cool. Because he was a fat Joe. Yeah, and that's what, and that's what, he was a big fat Joe and his ass crack was hanging out and he's like, everyone's like, oh, it must be because he's slinging rocks. That's what I thought. No, no. Not today. Another uh, another one that we've lost too <coughs> early, man, was one of Joey Crack's big mates. Big pun. But he was a big dude, man. They were both big at the time. Joe's but lost, not Joe's big, lost stacks in soon. Oh, dude. heaps. But but uh, big pun was massive, man. You know there's that f- photo of those two with the suits on? Yeah. Those baggy suits. Huge. Su- big boys, that, man. I think they, they went to like some Florida hip, hip-hop convention or something together. Yeah, he was telling one of these. Stuff. I can't repeat the story, but he told me. <laughs> Tell I was, me afterwards. No, nah, he, he said you're never allowed to repeat it. But <laughs> uh, I think that photo was from there. 
and it was like there was a whole uh, yeah it was a whole thing he was one of my favourite guests well there you go oh yeah an Australian uh, person Australian celebrity uh, yeah for sure <laughs> um, alright so yeah that piece, we're, right? we're gonna talk about Aussie hip hop because obviously that's so fucking connected to graffiti yeah, no. it's all part of it so Bias B you've had him painting there as well no, Adam hasn't painted before, uh, but I name all of my specials after bias mm-hmm. lyrics or songs. Uh, I think they just epitomise what Melbourne graffiti is, or what certainly what it was mm-hmm. when I was growing up, and, yep. and what was you know what people identified with. Beeswax was the classic. Yeah, man. what a belter. Mm. Um, and I just think that his lyrics were. But, you know, he's from he's from the Hursty line as well, which is, you know, Easy's is kind of technically on that line, I guess, if you were to look at it yeah. that way, Collingwood's, Collingwood Station on the way up. And, yeah, I just, I don't know, I've just always liked it. And I think he's, his lyrics or song names fit perfectly with the burgers that we've made because what we've done is, you know, specifically Melbourne. So mm-hmm. I think that always helped. Totally. Um, yeah, like the first the first special we did was the, the Melbourne Madness, which mm-hmm. was when we put a potato cake in a dim sim and dim sims are from Melbourne. Uh, they are indeed. So it just seemed like you put your two, two patties, bacon, potato cake, dim sim, it just seemed like Melbourne madness. It is. And then as we got bigger and did more stupid things, there was like the Metropolitan Mayhem, mm-hmm. which was the flow on from the Melbourne madness, Melbourne madness line in the song. And he's appreciative of all this. Like he takes yeah, it. Hell yeah. He comes all the time. He's the best. Awesome. He man. just pops in and he I'm seems like, oh, like, what's up? I don't know him personally, but I follow him on Instagram, obviously, and I see him. He seems like a pretty genuine dude He's who legend. just, like, loves the culture and, like, you know, just still stays true to what he's fucking, what he wanted to, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, and he's also, he's really appreciative. Uh, he's There's a documentary coming out that he filmed his section or his interview at Easy's. He's really appreciative of what it's provided for him. Mm-hmm. I think that's the main the main thing and where he's come from and what it's what he's been able to achieve along the journey. Yeah. Uh he's very grateful for what the Melbourne hip hop scene and graffiti have been able to to provide for him in his life. Mm. And like that there's a whole industry rad. around all of that stuff now. Obviously with you from the hospitality point of view, but there's the art thing and there's probably countless musicians that if you ask them or Aussie rappers or even just musicians in general that say, Man, I looked after this guy who could fucking make an album out of nowhere, you know what I mean? So that's Yeah, fucking- just about regular shit too. Like mm. I mean, you know, if you ask me honestly, a lot of I'm I think that I'm really grateful that Aussie hip hop has been reclaimed by those who live in a press life or have come from nothing or, you know, are First Nations Australians, that they've reclaimed what hip-hop is and, and the roots of what hip-hop is. Because a lot of Aussie hip-hop, when I was growing up, was by white people who didn't really have that much to really complain about, right? No. So I'm glad that that's been reclaimed and it's become more real again. You know, the the rapping about graffiti and smoking bongs and shit kind of gets a bit tiresome. It does, but, but at the time it was poignant to me, and it was poignant to the culture that it was that it had formed within within hip hop in in Australia as as like a if you were to take a direct correlation between the the US East West Coast rap and Melbourne rap, it was what was relevant to those people at the time, but not really substantial, if that makes sense. It's well, uh, yeah. Look, there's there's two sides to the coin. I think. Personally, hip hop is about being who you are, being true to yourself. So when dudes are like, oh, "I'm out here fucking shooting dudes," like you're not. If you're in the park smoking bongs with your mates and chucking a few tags, we'll rap about that. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So I think that there's two. Yeah, it's that like- expression. <laughs> but like that, uh, I mean, that's not. I don't know. I feel like songwriting requires yeah. a little bit more soul or a little bit more substance to it, right? Totally. Uh, but I just think that you when Bias came along and he's talking about painting trains and hanging out on the Hursty line, I think a lot of it connected with a lot of people because they're like, we're listening to this American hip hop, but when but this me, is relevant to this me. This is relevant to me because yeah, we hang absolutely. out at the train station. Like we're absolutely. not on the corner with Big Al watching out to get shot. Yeah. We're hanging out at the train station where someone might steal your fucking Jordans, right? Yeah. That's a, that's about yeah, as, as scary as it gets. Absolutely. So it does make sense. But what you're saying is extremely valid. Like it's supposed to be for people that ha- have some sort of oppressed culture or uh, 
Look, I don't think it's supposed to be, no, but I think that's where that's where its historical roots are. So totally. that it's important that that doesn't get lost, and that it doesn't just become a cash grab for this rich kid because he's, you know what I mean? In the in the two thousand and late two thousands, early twenty tens, especially what was commercial with Aussie hip hop was very sort of middle class white kids, Look, and that's what kind of which I sort of am, right? But I, well, yeah, yeah, I wasn't. I mean, we weren't rich, but I wasn't poor. No. Per se, um, but I think you know it, the Hilltop Hoods man, managed to take it from being an underground music form in this country to being more of a mainstream commercial radio type uh, music. But don't forget, they'd been doing it for fucking yeah. fifteen years or whatever before they got played on Nova. Yeah, I remember. You know, like they start like two thousand. I think I saw them at the corner. Yeah, and then. Like nosebleed section or that whatever that was at left foot right no, foot. That was the, call, uh, the, call, the calling. Was that the calling? That was the one that really set them off. Yeah, the calling, and then all of a sudden it was fucking here we go. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and but like they'd still been grinding away. They ever, yeah. they ever. No, you know they've been underground for a long time. So yeah, credit where credit's due. But then it was interesting because you know I'd go to work. And someone's like, oh, yeah, you listen to hip-hop. Have you heard of Hilltop Hoods? I'm like, come on, man. The, wor- the worst is when come someone on. says, I don't like Aussie hip-hop, but I like the Hilltop Hoods. You're like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, that's someone who's listened to fucking Triple M too much. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah I don't know if they played on Triple M, but I'm just thinking someone who's they been- probably f- played on Gold 104 what? these days. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> I, but, but I've been reading, I've been doing my garden with my neighbor and Gold Wine of Four's been on. Fuck, there's some songs on there. Like obviously we're not young anymore, but I'm like, dude, is this really on Gold One O Four? Makes me kind of go. We got to there, have we? Have we got, got to, to there? there. Yeah. But I, th- I feel like their songs are only probably ten or fifteen years old. But that's yeah. that's classic oldies. Now, yeah, hundred percent. But yeah, I'm really I, I am grateful for the direction that I think that Aussie hip hop's gone in, and and even if you look at like the drill scene. And the way that that's popped off, like these are people who are genuinely oppressed, and they have something fucking more hectic to rap about, right? Totally. And then all the the movement that stemmed out of First Nations rappers, I think, has been really important. Like Kobe D's a fucking jet. Yeah, man. Briggs has been able to change that. Like Bad Apples as a record label has been able to change the direction of where that that type of music has gone. Mm-hmm. And there's you know Bar- Barker is on a whole other level yeah. of of rappers and doesn't get anywhere near enough credit that they should. Well, both those Kobe D and Barker have been hosting the uh, hip hop show on Triple J since Howes left the last sort of few weeks. And see how Howes an absolute. Don of the music mm. industry. I in miss country. him though, man. Like that was, I'd be driving home from a gig on a Thursday, and he'd always something give soothing you, about his. Yeah, about it was, his he was voice, good. Right? It's a shame. It's a shame that he's not still doing it. But I think with Aussie hip hop and like you, you said that drill thing, and it happens to be really Sydney, really Brisbane. They seem to have that drill kind of more of a more of a American influence flavor to it when the I don't think drills more heavy heavy uh, on like the grime, the grime side of things well there's still like the the Chicago drill thing True. and that it's also maybe more trappy as well they've yeah. got to that but the Melbourne hip hop seems to be just like a little bit more east coast influence like that old fashioned and and grimes. yeah Beats and that's and it and I think Adelaide too as well has stuck with that and the stuff that's a little bit more north is gone down that path my favourite quote of that that chat with Lord Finesse was like what do you think of the direction that that hip hop's going in you know um, and is it re, is it being redefined is it is it or is it something different you know because you had mumble rap and you had mm. these other heavily auto-tuned rappers that uh, rappers in inverted commas uh, and he's like, man, hip hop's already been defined. It's beats and rhymes. That's it. That's it. If you just jump off in between that, then you're making something else. It's an offshoot. It's a different flavor. It's something new, which is cool. And I respect that. It's cool because it had to, had to, everything has to stem from somewhere. Mm-hmm. You know, hip hop's a derivative of R and B and blues and all these other things that have and poetry and all these things that have popped off sideways. But like hip hop as a as a, a music genre has already kind of been defined. Mm-hmm. And yeah, yeah, and there's subgenres within any genre, and that's how new genres are formed. Correct. Um, but I think it all comes full circle back to that, like you said, the beats and rhymes and that sort of thing. And that's, I think Melbourne is is 
doing its fair share to 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 hold that sort of strong. I haven't deviated too far away from that. There are some areas that have, but it's very it's very prominent, and I think that's something that we should be fucking pretty proud of. With Absolutely, like. and I think that there's I think that there's also I know briefly touched on it before we even started this conversation. The boys from Posse Shot mm-hmm. are like holding Melbourne down in general, just because they have an appreciation for all of these music forms, right? Yep. Very intelligent fellas that understand all of it, but they want to make sure that the music that they're bringing to people and their culture that they've their own little sub the posse shot subculture that sits underneath hip hop is so powerful and so strong you see it every day the boys post fuck I was walking through Paris and there was some homie rolling up doing a kickflip on the thing get the money up man and like that's fucking mad Mm. you know that's real mad and their music is beats and rhymes they still got beats and rhymes and mm-hmm. they fucking throw it out to old guys that tracks with bias doing tracks with brad strutt yep you know if they could get any one of the melbourne the old melbourne rappers on i'm sure they would do in a heartbeat because they have an appreciation for that and that history of it um so i think that that for that reason i think it's still holding down like that yeah totally and those guys are fucking real smart man like their merch everything that they yeah. do is spot on Fuck like yeah. P.S. panthers are fucking cool so why not use that yeah. as your logo like yeah, yeah it and just and yeah, they it's just sick. get it because they live and breathe the culture, right? Yeah. They're not just doing it because they're trying to make money off it. They're just doing it because they fucking love it. Mm. Uh, yeah. and it, it comes through in everything they do. Yeah, and that's uh, that's the the graffiti and that's the graffiti influence in hip hop culture. Like I think that's a great. lot of other hip hop music that's been made doesn't have that graffiti or that hip hop um, fucking essence to it. Doesn't have the heart. Well, it doesn't because now, like you mentioned, it's, mumble it's rap, buying shit, well, people, having kids, shit. I got yeah. I got a Rolex. I got a car. Yeah, what do you fucking do, man? Nah, what do you do? You don't actually have it. You borrowed it for five minutes. Yeah, it's, it's good not worth to sort of see to. some of these dudes sort of come unstuck, like fucking, you know, the internet dudes six nine and stuff. You start to see them come unstuck. Like, I, I don't want to I ain't ta- comment on that shit. No, yeah, but I don't care that much. Nah, but I'm just like, okay, look, let's bring it back to what hip hop was about, and it's awesome to see that someone who's made it to the top, like fucking old mate Joey Crack, who still wants to paint trains and still. You know, be a fun cunt. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I love Collect that. Collect sneakers. But, yeah, he I'm could... Sure, I'm sure he'd break dance if he fucking could. <laughs> Man, you Sorry, know, he was, I reckon he was the first dude to lick the bottom of a shoe during yeah. that, like, Cribs episode. Yeah. yeah. He had the Jordan, the, the... I think that was the... What were the... The, the Jordan... Um, in the two, 1992s. And he's like... Yeah. He did that one. They were that clean and, and that licked the that bottom of them. He licked the bottom You know how he had, like, a whole separate house in New Jersey just for his sneakers? That's nuts, man. And he still yeah. comes and paints trains in Collingwood yeah, for legend. fun. Yeah, legend. that's awesome. Joey um, Crack. So, Joey Crack. Terror um, Squad. So, yeah, te- yeah, man, the Terror Squad, the TS. Uh, so, look, aside from the whole hip-hop thing and that, that sort of stuff, like food is your main – well, not your main, but one of your passions – and you managed to turn it into a fucking business. If you weren't doing that, though, what would you be doing? Something more artistic, or did you still be there? Fuck, I don't know, it? man. I honestly don't know. I probably would have gone into social media or something. something I don't know. Probably yeah. just well, some. I mean that. I mean digital marketing or something like that. I, I do have a dream of becoming a sports presenter at some point in the future. I'd love to do sports broadcasting and commentary and stuff like that because I follow almost every sport. Yeah, fairly closely, and what would you want to do? AFL, or you'd want to do well, basketball. I think I'd like to be somewhere in between. Yeah, uh, I have. I know most American sports back to front, mm-hmm. and I think that there's certainly somewhat of a need for that in this country, and someone to broadcast it in the right manner, or to be able to comment on it in the right way that stands up in other markets. Uh, certainly, AFL. You know, I've watched probably every game of AFL that's been recorded for the last thirty years. Yeah, uh, from start to finish, and some of them multiple times. So I have an understanding of those things and I understand the, the analytics and the tactics behind all those things. So I'd like to do that, but probably digital marketing of some sort, I think would probably be where I'd be. I don't know. It's some, it it's seems so not fun or <laughs> sexy to talk about digital marketing like that, even though it's like what the world has become. Well, yeah, it's like we were kind of at that age when we we're in our 20s when it sort of comes along. So we got pretty well versed in it. Like people a bit older were like, oh man, let's just leave this social media behind. And people a bit younger have always had it. So I think we kind of had to like adapt or not. From that space of before computers. Yeah. Or well, like computers were a thing, but almost a thing. And like, well, I mean, I was saying before that I wasn't poor, but like I didn't have gaming consoles as a no. kid. Like you can forget about that. So all these things, I go to my mate's house or you borrow it from the video store to play video the games. Video you borrow it on a Friday night so you could have it until Sunday and you stay up the whole fucking weekend playing NBA jams. 
trying flat to- out just yeah. stay awake all fucking night two nights in a row um and then have to take it back yeah but yeah so i like having grown up and then into computers and i was a big i, I was an early adapter of computers because i'm a bit of a nerd when it comes to that stuff so probably hence why the social media thing came quite naturally to me but now it's just gone this video stuff and tiktok i'm finding kind of difficult to keep up with because it's so short there's fucking nothing in it there's no substance to what's being made can i make the stupidest thing can i just like what is it even about how do i maintain this person's attention and realistically back to lord finesse if it doesn't slap in the face in the first six to eight seconds it's not hot he was talking about music what he meant to you could easily apply that to essentially fucking people's attention spans in general now any topic any anything at all if it doesn't smack you in the face straight away it's not hot and that's why some hip-hop music can work as opposed to music before it's time because you can start with a hook which you couldn't do that with a rock and roll song so you could start with a hook you could start with a scratch you could start with somebody telling you a little bit of a story which Mm -hmm. with more traditional music before that you'd have to build into that yeah movie sample or some shit something like that yes something something that's I realised yesterday you know there's a fucking TV channel called the Wu Collection the Wu-Tang Collection I was just flicking through and I said the Wu-Tang it's all like Shaolin videos and shit like that I was like damn I was a new (laughs) favourite back when we were young uh, on MTV or Channel V or whatever it was, they had it was called Fo Kung Fo, and yeah, it right. was like we didn't have cable TV. <laughs> <laughs> we had yeah, it was like MTV or one of those cha- Channel V was the Aussie one, yeah. and it was called Kung Fo, and it was all the samples from because Enter the, the Thirty Six Chamber, yeah, from, and they yeah. would use that, and it was kind of that sort of with uh, Monkey Magic type stuff where they okay, would yeah. have Monkey Magic act- get cancelled now for sure yeah for sure but that was that and they would kind of like have fight scenes and then they would sort of use bits that they would and then they'd kind of have people yeah it was like a thing it's been around for ages but yeah yeah now it's like a free to air channel on the TV it's an actual channel yeah dude I was just I had to take a photo of it last night because I was in shock there's you know you go through the normal channels and then you go to the rest of the channels there's some bizarre there's like some 7,000 channel 7,000 something you know Kill Army that where they dudes just like neck themselves Wu-Tang Collection TV yeah that's bizarre Mission Kiss and Kill. Fuck yeah. Um, yeah. There's yeah, there's way too many T V channels. But that's also when we were kids, you didn't have the access to go and find what you wanted to at your fingertips. So if you liked hip hop music, you had to go find it. Where where I remember like you mentioned the Sally Yards earlier. I remember being at the Sally Yards probably like ninety six or might have been like year seven or something. Um, and there's a dude playing records and just hip hop and like Unless you had an older brother or unless there was no any way to hear this stuff. Like, mm-hmm. you couldn't go to a nightclub to hear it because you weren't old enough. Also, they didn't play it there either. But, yeah, well, there it was It wasn't no, played in nightclubs. There was, yeah, I don't, you I'm, go to a skate shop and that was about the only spot you hear people playing a, a tape or, like, I think, obviously, CDs came out in... But, the, you, well, but you didn't have 30 ra- bucks to go buy a CD whatever. and you're not going to risk yeah. your whole fucking you know allowance or whatever however you got money no, on some if you, on but if you go to the record store you can rack that shit <laughs> yeah but like <laughs> you had that for, for 30 bucks you weren't going to go buy something you, yeah. you know you'd buy second hand CDs off someone you listened to it with their discman so you knew that you liked yeah. it $4.67 or $4.65 or whatever I was making at Mac it wasn't buying me a CD but anytime so yeah. I'm not doing a whole shift just to get one CD but that's the thing and I think kids these days don't oh, they sound like a fucking old come out but we like are. I just don't think that they understand how much effort and but think about even before us like how how hard it was for our parents to get totally. records or people whatever. would share records yeah. and that's the thing and that's but now if you like something you just type in how do I do this how do I find this and it's right there like there's never been a better time for somebody in any cr- creative capacity to just fucking figure out what they want to do and just do it yeah so yeah no it's one that you, you can actually do whatever you want thing is like a legit thing it's a thing yeah yeah, yeah before you need to have like known someone to get there or done this to get there or whatever but now you just need to fucking know what you want to do want to do and yeah. that's uh, like this and even then you could probably just ask chat gpt or someone and be like what the fuck should i do man i like this 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 and this and this what should i fucking do this ai thing is pretty scary it's terrifying it? yeah and i really don't like it but it's not going away so i think we've got to kind of fucking deal with it i think it goes off in a big bang right Oh, things are something's got to give, man. Like it can't keep. It's, got, it's changing I've so seen quickly. It. I watched The Matrix already, man. I know what happens. <laughs> I know what. Happens. I know what happens. <laughs> it's the best documentary ever made. Um, all right. So, as most dudes, when you get to your late thirties, your friends go, "Fuck, man, you got to come play golf." 
I get told all the time, I'm going to go play golf. But I don't want to go play golf. <laughs> Did anyone tell you you wanted to play golf or you decided I kind to of a, I mean, I'm a sport kid, right? So you I just played, wanted to play. You've I always played, played golf? Sport. I always played sport. Well, I played golf, but like not seriously played golf. I uh, I liked it. I played. My grandma used to play with me. Uh, she turned 92 the other day. Uh, 92 and... Anyway, she took me until I was like six or seven. I beat her and she's like, I'm not taking you anymore. You can get fucked. <laughs> um, and then I kind of, we used to play a bit and I lived in North Melbourne and Royal Park was really close. So we play after school or whatever, but never really that seriously. And kind of coming up to COVID, I'm like, fuck, can't play footy, can't play cricket. I need a, another way to find some way to exercise or trick myself into exercising. Snowboard still. I was playing basketball still then and I fucking suck at basketball. So I'm like, oh, maybe I'll just start playing golf more. Yeah. Uh, and then COVID hit and I couldn't understand why we couldn't play golf because yeah, you're in a park sense. with your own fucking clubs as far away from your mates as possible unless you're all fucking freaks and you hit the ball in the same spot. You're miles away from them. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, and then after COVID, I started taking it more seriously. Uh, did, you know, had some conversations with Callaway Golf and they looked after me and sort of went from there and kind of began this journey of, trying to become better at golf but unfortunately i still have a job as much as that's quite easy for me to balance the two especially uh, when you've got royal easies down yeah well so yeah that was kind of the backside of covid i had this garage space we're paying stupid amounts of rent on like if people would have a heart attack if they knew the rent that we pay it at easies but you know it's, it's got train carriages on the roof no one else does right so line from happy gilmore you know what else would draw a crowd of golf with an arm growing out of his ass <laughs> Um, so we've kind of got a, an arm growing out of our ass on the roof uh, and we had this wasted space so I decided to put the simulator in there and create a private room where people could come and practice and it's like the full high tech shit from the same as ones I have at Drummond by a full swing the one that Tiger Woods had in his house um, and just a private room for crew to come and watch sports hang out practice your golf or have a round of golf with your mates now mm -hmm. it's winter time it's really good it's dark and it's wet uh and eat burgers and have people serve you is it improving your game uh i haven't had much time to hit it and also i was really grateful that the weather was quite good over summer so people got to actually get out and play a lot of real golf in the uh in the real world which is nice and i tried to take advantage of that as much as i could um my game's definitely gotten better, but it could get a lot better if I really took it seriously. I don't uh, the practicing part. I still struggle with. But that's the whole. I'd rather game just play, right? You've, yeah, but you got to you, you play. You, even if you go with your mates, it's there's camaraderie or whatever. But you're still playing against yourself. That's the best thing about golf. You only ever play against yourself, and you've got no one else to blame. It's you, and you've got to overcome adversity real quick. Otherwise, it's a fucking long walk if you're having a real shit time. Like you need to. You need to fix it. If you're going bad, you can fix it quickly or not fix it quickly, but just get back on top of it. Try not to fuck up. And it's it's been a really good thing for me in the business world and my personal life and, and just in interactions with people in general. If things aren't going right, how do you resolve it and how do you not let that affect the next move you make, right? It's like a form of meditation. It really is. Mm. And, and I can exercise understand at that. the same time. Yeah. Uh, as long as you don't take a cart, you know, occasionally you take a cart if you're drinking too much beer. But um, I try and walk most of the time. And, you know, you walk 10Ks without thinking about it, which is a good ex good piece totally. of exercise for some of my age. Um, so, yeah, it's been a really good thing for me. And I think there will be a lot more people take it up. It struggles in the sense that it's always had this stale, pale male element to it. And I think that, that uh, I'm hopeful that that's slowly being overcome with post COVID people being more attracted to it with live golf obviously that's still a male tournament and until they create a female equivalent of live golf i think they're gonna i mean we will still face that but that's created a fun element to golf and, and an understanding that it's not fucking stuffy and boring and you've got to be quiet and you can't have any fucking it's not fun. going it's, anywhere is it because they, like, tried, oh, they no, tried to shut no, it down no. didn't they they tried yeah. to shut it down by saying those dudes can't go on the actual pga tour and whatever. then they had to change and then the pga tour had to change to try and let them in i went to the the tournament they had in adelaide in april and it was fucking unbelievable it was mm. so much fun and I don't think that that will change. I think that the most they'd had on a day to a live tournament was like 5,000 people. And they came here and they had 40,000 a day or something stupid or 25, something, yeah. something ridiculous, whatever. Um, and it was so much fun. I think they've got two tournaments here next year. 
like it's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and i think hopefully they can create a female version of it to make it more inclusive and have more of an more of a an uptake but we're lucky in australia we've got some really really great young female golfers and they're really great advocates for the sport um and it's golf's a sport where i think males and females have been treated pretty equally for a long time as a, a lot uh, as opposed to some other sports not really not as much no no, not really i'm i well, know I mean, fuck all about golf but i just know that there's well, always been the men's and the women's i think that'll change soon because a lot of the the professional women are getting stronger and they can hit the ball further so as it currently exists the women's tees are often closer to the hole than the men's tees mm -hmm. i think that will change i think they'll become equal yeah uh, and then there's no reason why the pay can't become equal then mm-hmm I don't see why not. Like, there's no difference in the sport at all. You are just playing the same sport that I'm playing. Essentially playing against yourself. You should yourself. get paid the same amount. Yeah. Full stop the end. And I think that's the only... Uh, and I think that there's... The, I think that the, if you asked a lot of the the professional female golfers if they would be happy to tee off from the men's tees and get paid the same amount, they would say, fucking oath, let's go. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that that's a... It's, it's moving that way. And I'm hopeful that a, li a female live tournament... And I think there's a... There's a local tournament called the Player Series where the women and the men play together in Australia, mm -hmm. which I think is really good. And they play for the same prize money. Like they, the winner is the winner of the tournament, not the men's winner or the women's yeah. winner. It's the winner. Well, I think when there's no sort of physical, you know, people arm wrestling each other and they're just teeing off, why can't they just all do yeah, it? Absolutely. You don't need any gender boundaries with that sort of thing. No, I don't think so. And, and then if people are transgender or whatever, that there's no question of which one they're in. They're just in the tournament. Well, that's right. Then it, then that removes that argument completely. Exactly. It becomes an ultimate inclusive sport when it's been the most, you know, exclusive sport for so long. It has the opportunity to become the most inclusive sport of all of them. Turn it around. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, now, I've got to ask a really hard-hitting question, man. Go on. Is there a such thing as a chicken burger? Fuck no. <laughs> I was I was real bummed that my mate was going to record it the other day. I had some Americans that I bumped into at the at the footy. They're like, I don't know what the f we started talking about burgers, and they're like, I don't know what the fuck's wrong with you people. You can't have a chicken burger. They're like, we call them chicken sandwiches in America because the burger part is the beef. I'm like, oh my god, if I had fucking the video camera then, I yeah. would have been able to not have this conversation with people ever again. I'll tell you why. The hamburger or the hamburger sandwich which is what a burger is, mm -hmm. is an abbreviation of hamburger sandwich. Mm -hmm. The hamburger part comes from the people of Hamburg in Germany who moved to New York. It was the closest port between Germany and America. And when they got to America, they started making Hamburg steaks, which is a derivative of a steak tartare. A steak tartare was brought to Germany by the Tartars, the Russians, and they got it from the Mongolians, and it was essentially ground beef and raw beef. It was a steak tartare. Then, obviously, Americans are lazy, put it in a couple of pieces of bread, and we'll call it a, a hamburger sandwich. Mm -hmm. So if it doesn't have beef in it, it's just a different type of sandwich. It has to have the hamburger part for it to be a, a burger. Hamburger sandwich, abbreviated to burger. Put chicken in there, you've taken the hamburger part out, it's a chicken sandwich. No longer a hamburger sandwich, chicken sandwich. Chicken sandwich. That's it. I think people get confused because they say it's a burger bun. If it's in a it's burger bun, It's just a roll. Bun, they think, oh, it's a bread roll. Okay. So we're not calling it a burger bun. It's a bread roll. It's a roll. It's a roll. Or bread or whatever. <laughs> okay. Or bread. Whatever the fuck so you want to call it. So what about a faux meat sandwich? Is that a burger? Well, technically it's a salad sandwich. But a I salad don't. sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> it's impo they called it impossible for a reason. It's impossible for it to be a burger. No. <laughs> But you've got that on the on the menu at Easy's. Yeah, we've got those things, and we look. I think we're very conscious of people's dietary changes and what they choose to eat. And you know, I, when we first opened Easy's, I just wanted one cheeseburger on the menu with fucking nothing else, and it would have been great because you never have to do anything else. It's a cheeseburger, chips, potato cake. Well, when Done. you look when you look at uh, like In and Out Burger, super simple, everything's there. Like that model seems to work for them. I think a lot of people have tried to do that same sort of thing, and they keep it really simple. Is that something that I you think, think it's? I I I think that that can work, and I don't see. Well, I think you'll see a lot of menus in a lot of venues start to get stripped back mm -hmm. over the next little while, and that that, acro that applies across the board because there's only so many things you can do well in the one place. Um, obviously, there are derivatives of different meals where you can make different changes, where you're just adding a different. You know, like Indian, you add a different gravy to the same 
the same um, stuff that you've got with it. I think when it comes to menus from fine dining all the way down to casual, they'll get stripped back. I think you'll find McDonald's starts to get stripped back moving forwards. You know, I, I was shocked the other day. I went to Hungry Jack's. And I got whatever their fucking angry whopper thing was and a chicken sandwich. It was like 30 something bucks. Mm. Well, you could go to Easy's and get the same shit for 30 bucks. And I yeah, always thought that we were like, we use premium ingredients, not this fucking shit. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I was shocked at that. Um, and McDonald's was heading that way too. Like, what's a double quarter pounder now? Like, Eleven dollars, ten ninety five or something. See, McDonald's had that sort of really stripped back menu, and that's why it was good, and that's why I think their franchises or the way that they managed to roll out so many because they kept the menu simple. Mm-hmm. Now they've got more stores than ever, and they've got more fucking things on the menu than ever. So it kind of goes counterintuitive to why, what made it work in the first place. Absolutely, and it was to sell time and re- real estate for them as but a I, business. It was real estate purchases, and which would be interesting to see how that goes with Dan Andrews' new uh, land tax and payroll taxes, because if they own lots and lots and lots of properties and their investment properties, and then they have to pay all this extra payroll tax, is that going to affect them? Or are they going to find a loophole to get the fuck out I'm of it? I'm sure they've got their fucking... But if, I mean, what happens What happens then? Do they strip it back? Do they lose stores? McDonald's is not in the business. They don't often like closing stores. In fact, that's like their least favorite thing in the world. They do. don't, man. But when you think about it in like the CBD and stuff, there's plenty of shops, like stores there that have closed down. Like there, a few of them have stayed, but there was more on Burke Street that have gone. Oh, the there underground. The two, one. there was the underground and then there was the other one up. There was the two top, opposite, opposite each other. Opposite Greater Union or whatever yeah, the yeah, exactly. used to be. Yeah, exactly, yeah. There was a few that were around there and then they But they moved them. that one. Now they've got the one opposite Hungry Jack's on that corner. So they just moved that across the road. So I, I do, I love the way that you are a, a burger aficionado, but you still go to Hungry Jack's and Macca's yeah, well, fuck to do I'm... your research or just because... No, nah, just because I love the fucking double quarter pound. I don't go to Hungry Jack's very often, I'll be honest. Their chicken sandwich is not bad. Um, their new one that they've got is pretty good. But like the double quarter pounder, steam bun, cheeseburger onions, that's as... That's, for me, that's like spot on what so but okay aside from the big fucking takeaway places where's the bet besides easy's obviously where's the best burger or chicken sandwich in melbourne there's fucking heaps out there now it's but gross. yeah well you got to pick one oh, no i don't just, <laughs> i don't have to pick any i get to drive around and go and check and check them all out all the time well, what's one of you what's i love what's the, a- i love the chicken sandwich at, actually i like the chicken sandwich at st berg's and I like the the Duchess at Royal Stacks. Those are probably two of my favorite chicken sandwiches. Yep. Uh, the guys at 300 Grams are doing really good burgers. Um, there's a lot popping up now that have like a, uh, Simon who's got... Fuck, mental blank what his burger's called. They were at the Reverence or whatever that... Westwood or whatever that... Uh, yeah, yeah, Simo. Yeah, Goldie yeah. Boy. Goldie Boy, that was one. He's so, one of the guys that messaged me, man. Well, he's OG, Jimmy. right? Yeah, Simo's a good dude. Actually, I did uh, years ago. I did a burger ring with him because he used to have a, a jewelry company called Rust and Regret. Rust and Regret, yeah. So I did a burger ring with yeah. him, like Simo and Nico, his brother. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, he was his burgers are good. Yeah, they're um, good, man. He's like smash patty, just smash simplified patties, it, right? Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. There's, I mean, so there's he's. I think so he's many, at the Croxton right? now. Oh no, the no, he was at Shock Kickers. Shock Kickers. Yeah, I think he's got his own spot popping up. Yeah. No, he's uh, a good dude. He's a good dude. dude. We love him. But yeah, there's lots. Uh, I'm really grateful there's lots out there. And I always said that, fuck, in my dream world, every corner had a great burger on it because I'd never have to think about where I was going for lunch. I wouldn't have to drive around. I'd just be like, oh, I'll go to this one. Go to the next corner. Go to the next corner. I tell you, man. It's I, gone I, that way with sandwich joints and delis now. They're fucking everywhere. Well, but everything goes through a fad with like food, man. Like I think the, the Vietnamese thing, like obviously it's amazing food, but that went through a real fucking, where that Vietnamese joints were opening up everywhere. Things go through sort of fads i don't know burgers have managed to hold on there was a mexican thing that everywhere had another fucking you know yeah i think burgers have always been that thing i always said that when everyone's like oh do you think this fad's gonna last i'm like well it's not really a fad like burgers have been and burger places have been around for fucking ever look at andrews that's exactly what i was about look to say at, look at danny's yeah you know these were Dan- andrews has been there since the second world war man that's was where i grew up in this area years? yeah Greggy still following on legend. the fan, fan, Greggy legend following on the family footsteps and he's still making those same fucking burgers and they haven't changed man since and 35 it's the best years joint. I've been eating them that I can remember not changed not changed they did they started to add more on the menu and I think I 
We used to have one in there. They used to do the Jimmy Burger where they did they? Uh, jalapenos and hot sauce on it with bacon. Yeah, that's uh, crazy for them, man. That's a bit out. That there. was early. And then they started adding a few others. They, I think they added the American and a few other things. But like just going in there on a Saturday night or a Friday night, it's fucking unbelievable. Amazing, it's, it's like its own little show. Own thing. People are spinning around and smashing the onions in, turning, like everything's about it. And the other big Greg who who worked there for, uh, I'm not sure if he's still there. He might be. I haven't been for a minute. But like f- f- the fact that he was able to fit in that kitchen with all these other people pumping out so many burgers is impressive as fuck yeah and so that that's the thing when people say is this a fad that's no. been there for forever right 1940 it says 45 on the front i think it was two years before that right. when he's and it's the it same his uncle that started greg's <laughs> uncle i think Great yeah uncle. and then his family and i'm pretty sure that his sister's husband now works there. well the whole yep. it's a whole family business yeah and that just goes to show that's not a fad that's a fucking that's a tried that's and true thing yeah yeah, and I think that burgers in general, obviously, like I was saying, in 2012, they took a bit of a shift, started to adopt that American model a little more. But yeah, it's not a fad. And I, you know, when I was doing interviews, they're like, do you think this fad's going to last? Well, the people who love doing what they're doing, they'll last because they love doing what they're doing. They're not in it just to make a few bucks and get by. And you've noticed that. You can see that. Royal Stacks has continued on in strength. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Danny's and Andrew's have stayed there the St. Berg's guys genuinely love what they're fucking doing. You look at Sydney, Sarah and James Robbins at BL Burgers and Bar Luca, they fucking love what they're doing. Yeah. Even Jovan Kuric, who had Pub Life Kitchen, he's gone back to do that shit as well because he loves it, genuinely loves Hamburg. So they stay around. It was all those crew that were like, I'm going to make heaps of money on this. I'm going to open up all these stores. I'm going to franchise this franchise. That's the well, problem. Fucking nice try, pal. Yeah, nice I try. Yeah, I'm sorry, but... If you had to come and ask me if it was going to work, I would have said, no, it's not going to work no. because you need to have the love and the passion for it. And so number one in that space, Simon from Simon Cow from um, from Grilled. Yep. I remember going to their 10th birthday and I was like, because he, Simon wrote the forward to my book and I was like, do you think you'd sell Grilled? Like, do you think that the healthy side of burgers is gone? Uh, he said, well, maybe, but I just love burgers and I still love it. I'm like, well, you get my support forever. Just by purely for saying that you get my support forever on that one. Um, so yeah, he's another one that's grilled still strength to strength and And because he loves it. They've ventured out to other sort of fast food capacity or other, whatever you want to call it, franchises within that umbrella as well, I think. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know exactly. I think rolled maybe. And then there's a couple of other ones. What do you think about like when you go to the MCG now and you've got Royal Stacks and those sort of places there? Like, that's awesome to represent Melbourne sort of food culture. Is it sustainable though? Do you think? Yeah, is absolutely. That, so that's it so that's, be done more. But is, so because I, I I wonder whether they do that from the MCC or MCG point of view to try and represent Melbourne or whether they think it's actually a fucking good idea. That's the kind of. So thing we were going to we the other so during that tender process because it changed it was spotless. Yeah. for like 36 years mm-hmm. we went in the tender with spotless so we were going to put easies in there right uh and then we had this pitch to put a train carriage inside the mcc members which would have been fucking sick, sick. yeah um and in the end they didn't get it delaware group got it and i think i don't know how that i don't know how or why maybe it was just they decided they wanted to change um and through that process then Danny from Royal Stacks and I commenced the process of trying to get in with Delaware so that we could get in there. Obviously, Royal Stacks is a far more palatable brand than Easy's. We're probably a little bit edgy for the MCG. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, I think Royal Stacks fits perfectly in there. And I think that that is a good thing. Mm. Um, I think they're going to do something similar with Marvel Stadium. There'll be something similar and a different approach there with more Melbourne based brands going in there, which is exciting uh, because. Um, unfortunately North Melbourne plays there every Sunday afternoon <laughs> um, so hopefully there's something good I can eat there actually I had a pretty good uh, meatball sub there the other day I was impressed by that um, did you put it on your Instagram? nah no, nah, I didn't but it was good um, when you do those Instagram stories when you talk about the burgers and obviously you must get people hit you up like